I know. I'm beginning to see why people like that place. <laughs> At first, I couldn't quite figure it out, but uh, it was brisk this morning. I got out and went for a, a nice walk, and I have a feeling that if I continue there very much longer, one leg will definitely be shorter than the other because everything is on a slant. But um, glad to be here with you this morning. Um, let's pray together and begin. Gracious Father in heaven, what a privilege it is for each and every one of us to be here today. Lord, we all have a history. We all have a background. We all come from different places. But you have brought us here today to worship, to fellowship with you. And I pray, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit will come and speak to our hearts today. Father, I pray that you will bless this message. It's not for me, it's yours. It's your word. I thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I can imagine it being one of those nights where the where the moon was casting shadows on the trees. The disciples were making their way through the city. And at the very edge of the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, with his disciples, made an interesting statement. He looks at Peter, James, and John, and he says, I want you to come with me as I enter into the garden. And as they made their way to the garden we find that something very, very difficult for Jesus took place. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. I'd like to begin with verse 36. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And this is Jesus, the Son of God. He takes with him Peter and the two sons of thunder. This is interesting. These three men are supposed to enter into watching and praying with Christ. In verse 39, he goes on to say, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them on their knees praying earnestly. Is that what it says? It says he found them sleeping, and notice who he addresses. He doesn't speak to the sons of thunder. He speaks to who? Peter. He says to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time, and he prayed, saying, My father... If this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again, and he went away and he prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still what? Sleeping. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now, out of all the verses that we've read, I think the one that stands out the most is verse 40, right? It's a question that Jesus is asking. And he's asking Peter the question, but he's also asking the other two disciples the question. So today I'd like to focus on this particular question. So you men could not keep watching with me for one hour. Now, when Jesus asked a question, there are only four legitimate reasons why. Number one, to discover something. Jesus would ask a question to discover something. But I don't think there was anything to discover here. So I don't believe that's the reason why he asked the question. Number two is to affirm. Sometimes he would ask a question to affirm people. Well, there's nothing to affirm them here. 
Number three, Jesus would ask questions to expose. Hmm. I believe he was trying to expose Peter, James, and John to their spiritual shallowness and their spiritual weakness. Now, folks, this message today may step on toes. I make no apology. Because what the Spirit of God does to your heart, He does to my heart. And we're going to talk about an area today that affects all Christianity. In fact, it's an epidemic that I have found within the Christian faith. As I travel around and I visit with people of all different denominations, I find that this is the missing link. And you say, well, what is it, Steve? We're going to find out about it in just a moment. Number four, the reason why Jesus would ask a question is to simply teach. And he definitely wants to teach the disciples how to follow him better. Now, before we go too deeply into this study, I would like for us to look at a truth revealed in this passage. And this truth really will resonate with many of us. And that truth is simply this. That our desire for spiritual goodness and greatness, in other words, to please God, to obey His Word, to be pleasing to Him, our desire for that is greater than our ability to carry it out. And I think we all know it. We may not confess it, but deep down inside, we know that the Bible sets a high standard, and in and of ourselves, it is absolutely impossible to measure up to the Word of God. So the truth is, our desire for spiritual success is greater than our capacity to fulfill it. I don't believe there's a person in this room that doesn't want to please God, right? Right? But remember verse 41 of Matthew 26, the flesh is what? In fact, Jesus said to the disciples, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And each and every one of us know that by our own experience. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but were any of you tempted this week? <laughs> Did any of us yield to that temptation? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, the Bible says. And John chapter 15 and verse 5, Jesus says this. And it's simple, but yet it's profound. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And here are the famous words. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Now I want you to catch that. For apart from me, you can do how much? Nothing. Nothing. We have no capacity of our own. We have not the ability to live a godly life outside of a relationship with Christ. We may appear religious, not spiritual. And there's a vast difference between being religious and spiritual. Jesus is speaking of a spiritual experience, and he's saying that if you are not connected to the vine, you may appear, but the real fruit is not there. In fact, the Bible says that there's not one of us in this room that are good. No, not one. That's why many of us are failing in our Christian life. We cannot live to the standard God has set up for us. I would like to share an example with you from Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31. Now, if you have your Bibles, please turn there. I know you're used to me putting everything on the screen. <laughs> but there comes a time when we need to have our Bibles in our hands or our iPhones or iPads. or I don't want to forget the Samsung Galaxy people, okay? <laughs> there are a few of you out there. In fact, how many Galaxy people do we have here? All right, we got one. All right. You know, for your age, you're cool. <laughs> That's what my grandkids say. 
<laughs> uh, you know, speaking of grandkids and getting older, um, I've got a good friend who's 86 years old and still plays senior Olympic basketball. Guy's in great shape. And uh, he said to me one time, he was 75 at the time, and we went mountain biking together. He went down two or three different times and told me he would never do it again, but he just had to prove to me that he could do it. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to do everything I can to be physically fit and mentally fit and spiritually fit so that I can enjoy my grandchildren and maybe even great-grandchildren. That really inspired me, and that really stuck in my mind, that um, we may be getting older, hair turning gray, turning loose, wrinkles, and all those kinds of things. Guys, I'm not talking to the ladies here, <laughs> but we can take care of ourselves. We, sh we truly can, and live for those that live around us. Now, back to the sermon. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, notice the conversation that takes place. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now notice what Peter says in verse 33. It gives us some context as to why Jesus singled him out and said, Why couldn't you watch and pray? Notice verse 33. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Boy, that's some confidence, isn't it? He said, I will never fall away. Mm. I will never fall away. Peter missed an important reality, didn't he? He really did. The reality that Peter missed is the word all. All. All will leave me. Peter was correcting Jesus. Peter was simply saying, listen, those sons of thunder, James and John and those rest of the characters, they may leave you, but you can count on Pete. Pete will not let you down. He was basing this belief on sincerity, right? He was. Now, I'm not picking on Peter, but I think we need to really realize what's going on here. And by the way, the bottom line of this message today is watch and pray. It's become a watchword, but I believe that very few people watch and pray. This is more than lay me down to sleep type praying or reading a little, you know, little Max Licato, and nothing wrong with Max, but reading just a little, a little devotional each day. Jesus said, could you not watch with me at least one hour? Ladies and gentlemen, and be connected to the God of heaven through the word and through prayer every day is essential. And you said, well, Steve, you beat that drum all the way through the meetings. Well, I know what has kept my soul coming from drugs and alcohol and losing a son who was 18 years old. All those things, ladies and gentlemen, were trials and tribulations. When God pulled me out of the drugs and out of the alcohol and he set my feet in a different direction. It was the Word of God. And I'm thankful for a minister that set me down and shared with me how to have a devotional life. How to watch and how to pray. I don't care how sincere you are, what denomination you belong to, whatever background you have, it's the same Jesus. Watch and pray. Never forget my good friend Dan, who shared with me how to have a devotional life, he said, Steve, little time, little power. Much time, much power. The Word of God is not out of date. It's not old-fashioned. It is the Word of God. It is the Word. So Peter, arguing with Christ, said, listen, everybody else might leave you, but not me. But notice verse 34. Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Wow. I believe Peter wanted spiritual success. 
But Peter's desire for spiritual success was greater than his ability to carry it out. Let me ask you a question. Did Peter walk with Jesus every day? Did he eat with Jesus? Did he go to church with Jesus? But where's the problem? There's a relationship that is deeper than the surface, ladies and gentlemen. There's a born-again experience that is not based on a church standard or denominational standard. It's based upon the Word of God. And the Word of God is crystal clear. We must abide in the vine. Any good works we do, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing more than the result of a born-again relationship with Christ. It earns no merit nor salvation. And when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we tend to feel a little superior. But when we allow the Word of God to measure us, and we're not measuring ourselves by someone else, we find that we need God. We need Christ. Now the lesson that I see from Peter's experience right here is that I, nor any of you, can remain faithful without watching and praying. Now what is watching? We understand what praying is. Let's give you some text to write down. We're not going to take the time to look them up, but it's John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58. It's being connected to the vine. It's spending time in the Word of Christ every day. The Word of God. And I'm not talking about just simply reading a few verses. I'm talking about in a prayerful attitude, opening the Word and beginning to read the Word and allow the Word to speak to our hearts. It's during those devotional times each day that the Lord hones and chisels our hearts. He speaks to us. In fact, he stepped all over my toes this morning as I had my devotional time. And I praise him for it. There will never, ever be a point this side of heaven, ladies and gentlemen, that we will not be growing and God will stop pruning us. But if we are depending upon a sincere desire, mm -hmm. a commitment to a church, commitment to a person other than God and His Word, we will truly, in the end, be a failure. The Word of God must be consumed each and every day. Now, we can't stay connected to Him without watching and praying. The question is, why do we desire all the great things of God and yet most of the time we don't watch and pray? And you say, well, Steve, you, you, you're making a general statement there about everybody. In the 34 years that I've been a minister and all the places that I have traveled, I have found one prevailing evil. A lot of sincere people, but the majority of them spend very little time in the Word and in prayer. And I'm not talking about time in the Word to argue with others or time in the Word to sit in a group and answer questions and philosophize over the Word. I'm talking about getting down with God every day, having a thoughtful hour and a place set aside for you and God alone where you go and you allow the Word of God to do its work on your heart. The only thing that's going to keep these kids, parents, is the Word of God. Amen. And the parents, and I pointed to them over there, but I'm talking about all parents and grandparents. <laughs> we must set an example. Our kids and our grandkids should see us daily, somewhere, in prayer and Bible study. And I have found that people that are born again, each and every day, because Paul said, I die how often? Every day. Every day. I have found that when we die every day, that he gives us new motives and new desires every day. He gives us victory in our lives. And some of you may be sitting here right now saying, well, Steve, I'm, no, I'm nowhere near that place. I need to come to Christ first. 
I'll tell you, God is merciful. He's kind and He's long-suffering and He calls and He speaks and He's working. And He will bring us to the place. Somehow, some way, the Spirit was able to get through the crystal meth, the coke, and all the other garbage that I was doing. He was able to reach me through all of that. He can reach us. And through the alcohol on top of that. He's good. He's great. Now, what is causing us maybe not to watch and pray like we should? The disciples believed, did they not? You believe, don't you? But I've had parents come to me and say, you know, my son or my daughter, they're, they're out there and they're not coming to church. Coming to church is important, folks, but that's not the bottom line. It's being born again every day. That's the bottom line. There will be thousands, yes, millions of people that can be lost in a church. It's the intimate, personal relationship with Christ that makes the difference. As we look at the disciples, we find that Peter believed. Peter said, you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, you didn't come up with that on your own. God revealed that to you. They did care. Their faith was shaky. But there was something missing in their experience. What was it? Listen carefully. It's so simple that we'll miss it. They did not understand their need. They did not understand their need. They felt secure and self-satisfied in what they already had. They felt safe and secure. Do you think that if they would have truly understood their need and understood what Jesus was going through in the Garden of Gethsemane that they would have watched and prayed? What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like this. We go through life, everything's going great. And then one day you look on your arm and there's some type of sore. And so you go to the doctor's office and the dermatologist takes a biopsy and then calls you back in about two weeks and you've forgotten all about it and he says you need to come to my office immediately and you have a conversation and he says it's melanoma and I have, uh, I have uh, reason to believe that it's probably all through your body and you only have maybe three months to live. All of a sudden ladies and gentlemen we will watch and pray. We get real earnest. We, all of a sudden, we rearrange our life. We rearrange the, 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 the things that we're doing. All of a sudden, the stuff that occupied our attention does no longer occupy our attention because all of a sudden we realize the hands of time are against us. They're against us. All of a sudden, we weigh every minute, every hour, Every day, every week, in the few remaining months, we realize that we have a need. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have the cancer of sin. We need Christ. And even after we've accepted Jesus as our personal Savior, we must come to the Word each and every day to continue that relationship with Him. The reason why people backslide is because they don't have a daily devotional love relationship with Christ. Now let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. In verse 38, Matthew 26, verse 38, Jesus was crying out, watch with me. The human side of Christ was crying out. Can you not enter into my ministry? Now listen carefully here. What did Jesus do every day? What did he do? He was endeavoring to save people and to heal people, right? Yeah. 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he looks at Peter, James, and John, his human side was crying out, Watch with me. I need you. I need my friends right now. I need you to surround me. You don't really realize what's going on here, but I have the cup and I must drink the cup. Peter, James, and John, your eternal salvation is weighed in the balance right here. Right now. I need you. And what did they do? What did they do, folks? Tell me. They slept. They were sleeping. They were sleeping. I would like to suggest that they had not entered into the ministry of Jesus. On the surface they had entered in, but not at this level. Not at this level. You see, when we are connected to Christ and we are spending time in His Word, our heart aches for lost people. People who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, but Steve, you don't understand. It is not popular for people to accept Christ today. That's kind of old-fashioned and out of date. Ladies and gentlemen, don't buy that lie. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ Jesus. And I've been told that in Asheville, there's really no one who wants to hear. Got wonderful people coming to the meetings where I'm at right now. Start at Monday night. Yes, I'm tired. But I'll tell you what. I see in that audience men and women who have no relationship with Jesus Christ, who are longing for something better. And God wants to use each and every Christian to lead somebody to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was crying out to Peter, James, and John, please, can you not watch with me? Do you not have the same desire? Do you not realize that eternal salvation is in the balance and that I need you right now? Every day, ladies and gentlemen, we are to fall on our knees and begin to plead with the God of heaven for those that are around us, those that we know are lost. And those of us that are Christians here, if you have a son or a daughter or a spouse or a friend or whatever that is not saved, why not get on our knees all night with the Word of God and begin to plead for their souls? It's easy for us to stand back and look at Peter, James, and John and say, hey, if I were in the Garden of Eden, I wouldn't have slept, Jesus. But if you're not praying now, or really, really into praying and studying God's Word, and you don't really have a burden for lost people, you wouldn't have prayed then, neither would I. There's a thousand different things out there today that can occupy our thinking. And some of you might be saying, well, Steve, you're not talking about TV and watching TV. You know what I have found? External stuff can only be corrected internally. And if you're doing something externally that you shouldn't be doing, and I'm not saying TV is evil, there's some evil stuff on it. But even good stuff can take away from the best stuff. What I have found is that the only way to change externally is to be cleansed from within. And the Word of God is the cleansing power. It's the sword. It's the, it's the tool, the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to work on our hearts. To work on our hearts. Now before we close... I want us to notice that there's a five-fold predictable pattern that Jesus saw as he looked at those three disciples. Five-fold predictable pattern that Jesus saw. Number one, as he looked at Peter especially, he saw self-confidence. He saw self-confidence. Remember... In verses 33 through 35, again, that's Matthew 26. 
They all said that they would not leave. And Peter, above them all, big mouth Peter, said, hey, hey, you know, I am not going to let you down. You can count on Pete. Number two. Spiritual lethargy. You say, what is spiritual lethargy, Steve? Self-confidence leads to spiritual lethargy. Oh, I'm doing great. You know, I go to church once a week. You know, I put some money in the plate. When they have Christmas plays and so forth, I'm there. At Easter time, I'm there. Occasionally, I help the church when they have a work bee. Pretty good. In fact, my neighbors around me, you know, that one down there, he's not converted and he smokes and drinks and he does this and that. And my neighbor on the other side, they just divorced because he was running off with somebody else's wife. You know, I, I'm a good guy. I'm a good man. Now, self-confidence doesn't always manifest itself that way. I'm going to make a bold statement here. What I say to you, I say to me. If you do not have a daily, intimate, personal relationship with Christ, watching and praying, you're trusting in self. It's self-confidence. The devil will back off of you. Have you noticed that? When a devil wants to ensnare us in self-confidence, he backs off. He says, you know what? I've got them on a maintenance plan. I want their pathway to be smooth and easy because they think everything is all right. And if I allow some difficulties, some Job experiences to, to fall upon them, they may turn to God. Yet the whole time they think they are with God. Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood. And Eric, you and I spent some time talking about that. Unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God, there is no life in us. Period. No life. That's what Jesus said. Spiritual lethargy. Self-confidence leads to this state. In Matthew 26 and verse 35, Peter said to him, speaking to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. Boy, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Then of course in verse 40, he finds him sleeping. Verse 43, he finds him sleeping. Verse 45, he finds him sleeping. But later on in Peter's life, later on, in 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Peter is speaking from a heart that had been there. Peter realized that he was almost swept away. And so later on when he writes this verse, it's within the context of a heart that was almost lost. He said, be wide awake. Be watchful. The biggest battle I face every day is not to spend time with Christ. You can tell the difference when somebody is spending time with Christ and when they're not. doesn't mean you're not having struggles and trials and, and tribulations and temptation and, and, and not yielding or yielding to sin. But it's seeking the face of God every day. The reason we get spiritual lethargy is because we don't understand the urgency. Where there is no urgency, there's no motivation. 
You're sitting in your living room and all of a sudden you smell smoke coming from the kitchen. And then you feel the heat of the flames coming through the door into the living room. But of course you sit there and you're just kicked back and relaxed, right? All of a sudden you're moved to what? Urgency. Why? Because of the circumstances. You see, if we're not spending time in the Word of God and we're not praying and we're not involved in the ministry of Christ, then we don't sense the urgency. Oh, we sense the, the situations that are around us, the difficulties that we face and the little trials and tribulations, but we don't go deeper unless we're spending time in the Word. When we're deep in the Word, we really see who we are and our great need for Christ, our great need for Him. Now, those of you that have been coming to the meetings, you know my plight with my truck, right? And some of you are thinking, you know, maybe you should just get another truck. And some of you suggested to me, very lovingly, that I shouldn't work on my truck myself. I should keep my day job. I'm not looking at anybody who said that, but... <laughs> Talking about trials and tribulations, last Sunday, I'm heading out to go to Asheville. The meeting's starting Monday night. I get as far as Mooresville and my power steering pump. How many of you have been there before? You've heard the sound. So, first thing I do is I pull over, open up the hood, and I look at the reservoir, empty. I look underneath, it's bleeding like a stuck pig. My first thought is, oh, need a new power steering pump, so I made my way to an auto parts store, and I filled it up, you know, and then I got a, a power steering pump, and I got home. Finally made it back home, pull into my little shed, my garage, crawl underneath it, and lo and behold, it was not the power steering pump. It was the rack and pinion. It was the whole steering mechanism. So I'll call up a friend of mine who knows what he's doing. He worked in NASCAR. He comes over. He's got a degree in all of this, okay? He looks at it. No question. You need a new one. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know, Lord, I need to be in Asheville. What am I going to do? So I called around on a Sunday afternoon, and I found the part. And my friend said, you know, there's a young man I had baptized. I say, young man, he's 40. He said, I'm going to help you, Steve. I said, you know, Jerry, this may turn into a long, drawn-out thing. He said, no problem. 12.30 that night, we finished. That truck had been in Michigan for so long that it had actually rusted through the power steering, uh, the, the, the tube. And it was bleeding just like the differential had rusted through. That's bad. Don't ever buy a car from up north. If you have one and you look under it and it's rusting, sell it. But we all have trials and tribulations, and you're saying, boy, every other day you were having trouble with that truck. Those are small. Those are small things. You know the old commercial... It says, for everything else, there's visa. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to your health, it comes to the health of a loved one, all of a sudden, when those kinds of trials and tribulations hit us, cancer, et cetera, et cetera, there's an urgency. There's an urgency. We're living on the eve of the advent of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. Jesus is coming. And there are people that are going to a Christless grave right now. There are some people that are drawing their last breath right now. Obviously, we can't save everybody, but I'll tell you what, we can work with the people that God brings across our pathway. Number three, temptation. Now, temptation is not a sin, is it? No. No. But it's a sin to yield to temptation. But if we're filled with self-confidence, 
which leads to spiritual lethargy. And because of spiritual lethargy, we have this self-confidence, which leads us to temptation. And I can assure you that it is very predictable that we will yield to the temptation. And I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen men who are elders of a church that in the eyes of all the church members were standard bearers that, that did all the external stuff right and then some younger woman comes along and they lose their way and they leave their wife and they run off with the younger woman. I just know that to be true. When a guy's 76 years old and the woman's 45, now he's a handsome old devil. There's no two ways about it. The pillar of the church, supposedly. Ladies and gentlemen, we can look good externally, but it's the inside. It's the inside. And the inside is shaped and molded by the Word. And then number five, we need to close. I'm watching the clock. You guys put the clock back on the wall, I see. I liked it better when it wasn't there and I forgot my watch. Oh, I skipped. Oh, I'm sorry. Number four is sin. There we go. I was about to skip sin. It's so predictable. Now then, number five, self-destruction, loss, and regret. Self-destruction, loss, and regret. Let's go to verse 69 of the same chapter. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You too were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it. But he denied it. You know, the Bible says we don't know our own hearts. We don't know our own hearts. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're talking about. Sounds like a lie to me. When he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it, this time with an oath. I do not know the man. There was some truth to that. Some truth. A little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man, and immediately a rooster crowed. And in verse 75, And Peter remembered the words which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept Bitterly. This was so predictable. Jesus saw it in his own disciples. As he looks down today, does he see it in our lives? Does he see it? There's a way that which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And before we close, I want us to look very quickly at just one snapshot of a day in the life of Jesus as we close. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, in the early morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and he went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Who's our example in all things? Jesus. Jesus. So number one, we find Jesus getting up before the cares of the world or pressing upon him and spending time in prayer. He's our example in all things. 
And you say, well, I'm not a morning person. I'm a night person. Well, we can worship Christ anytime. We can have devotional time anytime. But the biblical example is to get it early in the morning. Remember the manna that fell? They had to get the manna before the sun came up and melted the manna. I have found that once the cares of the world come in upon me, no matter what my desire is, my attention shifts to all those things. And I want to say this right now. I'm not teaching salvation by reading the Bible, but I'll tell you what, if you're in love with someone, you want to, com you want to commit time to them, daily time to them. So Jesus prayed. This early morning devotion time was the morning after the day of great labors. More than any of us ever endured, He still prayed. We need to have a place where we have a devotional time with God. We need to have our Bible there. And if we use colored pencils or whatever, it all needs to be there. Our place of prayer needs to be there. We need to have a set time in which we're going to meet with the Creator, God. We need to have a time in which we meet with Him. But you don't understand, Steve. I stay up till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. It's hard for me. What are you doing at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning? It's legal. <laughs> it just takes a second. Well, I'm, I'm watching TV. Is that more important than spending time with Christ? Some of us are going to have to redesign our timetable and go to bed at night so that we can get up in the morning and spend time with Jesus. In closing, there are two patterns set before us. The pattern of the disciples before they were truly converted or the pattern of Jesus. Which pattern will we choose? And it's one thing to just say, well, I obviously choose the pattern of Jesus. To choose the pattern of Jesus means that we are willing to do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to make that happen in our lives. We need to plan it. We need to go there. And I've had some people say, but you don't understand, Steve, the Bible's boring. It's hard. I found when I was in electrical school, trigonometry was boring. I'll tell you what, once you get in and you learn the principles and you spend time, a secular pursuit can become easy. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And as we spend time in the Word of God, I'd begin with the book of John or the book of Hebrews. And begin spending time with Christ every day. You'll have strength in your life. When we lost our son Daniel, the thing that strengthened me through the whole process was my devotional time with Christ. Like I've shared with you before, I could taste the whiskey in my mouth. The old devil was pushing me saying, listen, see what God has done to you? Your son was killed in the youth building. What kind of God do you serve? Why don't you just go back, Steve, and give this up? This is foolishness. I knew that voice. But when you anchor your soul in the Word every day, there was strength that came to my heart that I knew was from above. I sent a text out this morning on the way here using, using my earpiece, speaking to Siri, to my friend Kurt, who called me Thursday night. His father had passed away. And I was just impressed to encourage the man. And he said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell my dad's life story without breaking down. And I just sent him a simple little word. Christ, help me on the day that we have the funeral for my son. He'll help you. And he just sent me, 
He sent me a text back saying, thank you so much. That means so much to me. I found that man, Kurt, at a mountain bike race. He was number one in the state of Michigan in the elite mountain biking racing. He was a backslidden Christian. And I'd started a little church plant like this in Novi, Michigan. I know Donald was there yesterday. That's what the news said. Started a church in Novi, and there was Kurt, who started coming to church, and his wife came with him. And now they have children, and he's an elder in his church. I'll tell you folks, we never know. We never know. By spending time with Christ every day, Christ brings people across our pathway. And we can sh share with them. Not only in them coming to Christ or coming back to Christ, but in the future when there's crisis in their life. We can encourage them. Fill your cup. As we close, let's pray. Heavenly Father, everything I presented today, Lord, we already know deep down inside. We know, dear Lord, we know. If we're a Christian, we know. <clears throat> With every head bowed and every eye closed, is there someone here today that would like to simply raise their hand to heaven and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to give you my heart right now. Take my heart. Is there anyone here that would like to raise their hand? Lord, you see the hands. Father, I want to thank you for the hands that were raised. Is there anyone here today that would like to raise their hand and say, you know, I want to be in that baptism on October the 8th. Would you like to raise your hand right now? Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy towards us and your long suffering. And Lord, we pray for Kurt and his family today as they lay their precious father to rest. Give Kurt the courage that he needs. Give us the courage that we need to live each and every day for you, I pray in Jesus' name.